As technology advances, people try to find ways of making machines more powerful and efficient. Steam locomotive designers were no different, trying to find the optimal wheel arrangements, weight, boiler size and so on to create better engines. One of the biggest problems for them to tackle, however, was the locomotive's tender, as it was essentially an extra weight the engine would have to waste energy towing around. But because it carried the engine's fuel and water, removing it would mean significantly reducing how far the engine could travel before needing to stop for fuel. In an ideal world, the tender would move on its own to help make the engine's job easier. And so that's exactly what some people try to do. The first example of a self-propelled tender came from France sometime before 1842, designed by Jean-Claude Verpillou. He'd helped in the construction of a line between saint etienne and Lyon, but the resulting railway was steep and couldn't support a locomotive heavier than 10 tons. As such, most contemporary locomotives were unable to work the line, so Verpillou designed an engine capable of traversing the gradient, fitted with an additional set of cylinders and driving wheels under its tender. The design was a success, so he and his brother patented it in 1842, with seven of these engines working the line by 1844. Nearly 20 years later, in 1863, Archibald Sturrock, chief engineer of the Great Northern Railway, felt that the performance of goods engines could be greatly improved by powering the locomotive's tender. Powering the tender's wheels would allow it to utilize the weight of its coal and water to provide extra tractive effort to the train, rather than waste the main locomotive's energy hauling it around. He took the tender from a sharp single passenger engine and had it fitted with two cylinders, outside cranks, and four-foot driving wheels before trialing the tender with several different locomotives, including engines on the Manchester, Sheffield, and Lincolnshire Railway. Three more tenders were built and fitted to Great Northern's engines number 391, 393, and 394 for further testing. These tenders were also fitted with heating equipment in the water water tank, which used the exhaust steam to preheat the water in the tender. Some modifications also had to be made to the engines to allow them to effectively utilize the extra driving power, such as a larger firebox, altering the injectors to use hot water, and adding a second regulator. Once properly fitted, the engines showed a substantial improvement in performance. Working the gradient between London and Peterborough, the engines normally operating the line would pull between 30 to 35 loaded coal wagons up the 1 in 200 gradient, while the engines fitted with steam tenders were able to pull 40 to 45. Satisfied with this, the Great Northern Railway ordered a new batch of 70 060 goods engines, all fitted with these steam tenders for freight work. However, they weren't entirely a success. I'll touch on that later. Not long after, in 1867, Morris Urban designed his own locomotives with powered tenders for use on the Chemin de Fer du Grand Central Belge in Belgium. I couldn't find much on these steam tenders, other than they were relatively simple in design and weren't particularly successful. Another design for a driving tender came from Edward Cecil Pulteney. His version used outside cylinders and Volschwarz valve gear, as well as featuring several other technical tweaks, such as limiting the cutoff for the tender's cylinders to make them more economical and less of a drain on the engine's boiler. Pulteney's design also allowed for tender engines to travel in reverse at speed much safer, saving time that would otherwise be wasted turning them around in order to head a train. Another major benefit of Pulteney's design was the joints required to transfer steam from the boiler to the tender were much simpler than most other articulated designs, like Garrett's or Fairley's, making them more reliable and maintenance-friendly. River Esk of the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway was fitted with a Pulteney tender in 1928, provided by the Yorkshire Engine Company. Multiple other Pulteney locomotives were built around the same time by the YEC as prototypes for proposed use on Spanish railways. However, all I could find on these engines was a few pictures and a post on RM Web. Meanwhile, in the United States, Southern Railways experimented with fitting tractor engines to their 282 MS2s in 1915. 
These were essentially steam tenders similar in design to Pulteney's, with the main difference being that these were also fitted with leading wheels and sometimes trailing wheels. Most of these tractor engines followed a 280 wheel arrangement, with a handful using a 260 and 262 layout. It's noted that the MS2s fitted with these tenders could move 30% more weight than their unmodified counterparts. However, the drawbacks they presented were enough for Southern Railways to lose interest in developing them further. This leads me on to why steam tenders never really took off, even though in many cases they showed to be a genuine improvement to an engine's performance. Firstly was their traction. The driving wheels on most steam locomotives are usually positioned under the engine's boiler to put as much weight on them as possible to help improve traction. With the steam tenders, however, they had to rely on the coal and water they carried to provide that weight. And so, as the engine used up said coal and water, the wheels would have less and less traction, resulting in them losing pulling power over time. Secondly was steam usage. Adding an extra set of cylinders to an engine naturally demands more steam from the boiler, and this became a problem for many engines as they often found themselves using more steam than the boiler could provide. Both Sturrock and Pulteney's designs took this into account and were fitted with boilers capable of producing enough steam, but even then, it still meant more fuel and water was needed to meet the demand. The tenders were also taxing on engine crews too, with firemen having to shovel more coal, and in some cases, such as Sturrock, design, drivers having to essentially operate two locomotives at once. It's also noted, with Sturrock's design especially, that the additional heat from the tender made the footplate unbearably hot, further adding to the contempt felt by those tasked with operating these engines. The massive maintenance costs for the tenders and how awkward they were to service also made them quite unfavourable for both the workers that maintained them and the railway directors that paid for them. But the most damning reason why they never caught on was the fact that, aside from Verpu's original design, they were simply too excessive for the work they were built for. The Great Northern Railway didn't need engines that could haul super long trains at the time, just engines that could keep up with demand, especially as most coal and goods trains often had to be shunted into sidings to allow faster express services to pass. Making these goods trains longer would not only make them more awkward to assemble, but also more unwieldy to shunt out of the way on main lines. Not to mention the length of the trains would be limited to the length of passing sidings anyway, and so you end up with more power than you really need. The same was true of River Esk. While the tender did greatly improve the engine's overall pulling power, the same desired results could have been achieved by building a slightly stronger engine, which would be both cheaper and easier to build and maintain in the long run than using the tender. River Esk's steam tender was replaced with a standard one in 1931, after just three years of service. The parts from the steam tender were later repurposed to build River Might. In the United States, meanwhile, it was found most engines were unable to produce enough steam to effectively utilize the steam tenders. While you could make the argument that they would have worked if the engines were equipped with appropriate boilers, it would still make more sense to just build a bigger engine without a powered tender, tailored to the needs of the railway especially in a country like the US that had such a liberal loading gauge. In the end, most engineers realized that the energy an engine wasted pulling a tender was relatively negligible, and that the 30% boost in performance most locomotives achieved with a steam tender wasn't worth the large amount of time and money they consumed. Many railways ended up scrapping their steam tenders not long after putting them into service, with most not even making it past the trialing stage. The Great Northern Railway ended up cancelling their order of steam tenders halfway through construction, and having the ones already built converted to normal, unpowered tenders. Let this be a lesson then that not every piece of dead weight holds you back. While it's always worth finding ways of making things more efficient, it's important to remember that it's okay for some things not to be optimized. Just focus on improving what's important, and the rest won't matter. Subscribe for more.